Claire was reading that passage from Exodus chapter 3, verse 4 says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. Evidently, the Lord was waiting to see if he would turn aside to see. Now, I know the Lord already knew he would. He ordained he would. I realize that. But I love the way the language speaks. He wanted to see Moses' interest in seeing this great sight. I want to be like Moses. I want to have an interest to hear what God actually says. Something happened to me this week that very rarely happens. I was talking to a man who said, I'm agnostic. I don't believe anything. Give it to me. I'm an open book. Let me hear what you have to say. When's the last time that happened to you? Very rarely. Uh, and I was quite excited to have that opportunity. And he listened. What he thought after I said, I don't know. But uh, I pray that you and I will have that attitude towards the Word of God. Give me what it says. I've entitled this message, Natural or Spiritual. Natural or Spiritual. If you'll turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Natural or or spiritual. God does not recognize the fleshly distinctions that we recognize. He doesn't recognize black or white or rich or poor or any of the distinctions we make, male or female. God does not recognize those distinctions. He recognizes natural or spiritual. Natural or spiritual. We read in verse 14 of the natural man, and we read in verse 15 of he that is spiritual. Now, what is meant by natural? What is meant by spiritual? What does God mean when he uses those terms? God wrote this book. What do these terms mean? Natural. What is meant by natural? Well, we read these words in Jude 19. These be they that separate themselves sensual. That is the same word. Having not The spirit. Now, the definition of a Pharisee is a separated one. These be they that separate themselves. Like the Pharisee in the temple, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. I am different. I separate myself. Something I've done has made me different from other people. These be they that separate themselves sensual, fleshly, carnal, having not the spirit. The natural man is the man who has never been born again. He's never been birthed by the spirit of God. That which is born of the spirit is Spirit. The natural man has never been born again. He's the way he was when he was born into this world. Carnal. David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. The natural man is described in Romans 8 7 like this the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, the mind you and I were born into this world with. The carnal mind is enmity against God it's not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be that is the natural man so then they that are in the flesh cannot 
please God, only one who is born of the Spirit is a spiritual man. He that is spiritual judges all things. Now, I've heard unbelievers call themselves spiritual. You ever heard that? I'm a spiritual person. I'm not materialistic. I'm in touch with my emotions. I'm in touch with the feelings of others. And I, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not just about materialism and money and uh, position and wealth and influence. I'm a spiritual person. No, you're not. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with being spiritual. A spiritual person is someone who is born of the Spirit of God. He is a spiritual person. Man, he that is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Now, when Adam ate the fruit that he was forbidden to eat of, do you remember how God said, in the day you eat thereof, that very day you shall surely die? Now, he didn't die physically. Uh, I heard somebody recently preaching on that passage of Scripture, and they said God is showing his mercy. He suspended his sentence and didn't kill him that very day. Well, yeah, he did. He didn't die physically. His soul didn't die. But his spirit died. Spiritually dead. A natural man does not have a spiritual nature. He knows nothing of being a new Creature, that's what a spiritual man is. He's been born of the Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, the new man, the new heart that God said, I'll give to you. A heart that wasn't there before. The hidden man of the heart. I love that term, the hidden man of the heart. You know, I have a man living in my heart that I can't even see, but I know he's there. I'm aware of him. I can't see him. I can't delineate and say, well, this, this is the new man acting and this is the old man acting. I, it's all coming through one consciousness. And so I uh, can't, like hot water and cold water come through the same faucet. He comes through one consciousness. But as far as, um, he's, he's hidden. I know he's there, but I can't see him. Peter calls him the hidden man of the heart, the new creature, the new creation, that which is not corruptible. These are scriptural phrases. Listen to this. He that's born of God doth not commit sin. Now, do you hear that? He that's born of God, birthed of God, the new man, doth not commit sin. Somebody says that means he doesn't practice sin. Well, that's not what it says. It says he doesn't commit it. And as far as that goes, are you somebody that doesn't practice sin? Well, if you think you are, you're deceived. Let me just assure you of that. That's not the case. He that's born of God doth not commit sin. Listen to the rest of the scripture, 1 John 3, 9. For he cannot sin. He lacks the ability to sin. God lacks the ability to sin, doesn't he? He can't lie. That which is born of God lacks the ability to to sin, the spiritual man. Now, he still has the natural man, the flesh, but he now has something the natural man does not have, the spiritual man. Now, what this is speaking of is the two natures, the natural and the spiritual. And what is so important about this? It's obvious, it, it's obvious the scripture teaches it from Romans 7, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but here's what's important about this. This is why this is so important. If I deny two natures, I'm actually denying total depravity. I'm saying that the grace works with the flesh. No, it doesn't. Bury the dead out of my sight. And in denying two natures, I'm actually denying the nature of regeneration in the first place, the new birth. That's how important this is. And that's what he's dealing with when he's talking about the natural and the spiritual. Look in verse 14. But the natural man, the way I was born into this world, the natural man 
the sensual man, the fleshly man, the carnal man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. He lacks the ability to know them. They are out of his reach because they are spiritually discerned. The only one who can discern the things of the Spirit of God is someone who's born of the Spirit and has a spiritual nature, the spiritual man. The natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. He might uh, uh, be able to quote some terms, but there's no real true understanding. And here's the difference. Um, he may even say he believes he's he, he believes in the doctrine of totally, total depravity, but he doesn't believe he's totally depraved. That's the difference. Um, the natural man receives not things of the Spirit of God. It, it, they're spiritually discerned, but, verse 15, but he that is spiritual, he discerns all things. He knows the gospel. He understands the gospel, and here's why he knows God. When he's hearing he knows that something is contrary to the attributes of God and the nature of God. He knows because he knows God. He's a spiritual man. Only a spiritual man can have communion with God. Only a spiritual man can pray. Only a spiritual man can love God. Only a spiritual man can discern what he's hearing. He knows God. And if he hears, if he hears something that's contrary to the God he knows, he knows it because he knows God. He that's spiritual, given the Holy Spirit, this new nature, <laughs> he discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned of no man. The natural man can't understand him. They say, well, you're crazy. Oh, you think you have two, uh, two natures. Why? Uh, so w which, one, uh, which one's working? How do you know? You know all the different, uh, you, do you have an a, a angel on the, right shoulder and a devil on the left shoulder and which one are you going to listen to which one are you going to feed uh are you going to feed the new nature you're going to feed the old nature and even those objections that's introducing a third party that does the feeding well i'm going to feed this i'm going to decide to feed this or i'm going to decide to feed that that's not what it is it's two natures natural and spiritual look how far paul takes this in verse 16 he says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who's known the mind of the Lord that he may advise him, instruct him, tell him anything? But we have every spiritual man, every one of God's elect, Man, woman, boy, girl, I don't care if it's a six-year-old that believes the gospel. We have the mind of Christ. Not just that we think like him or have the same views of him or the same philosophy of him. We have his mind. Peter called it partakers of the divine nature. We have his mind. Now, that's a... a we wouldn't believe that unless the Word of God said it, would we? But that's what the Word of God tells us. We have the mind of Christ. Now, back back up to verse 6 of this chapter. Paul says, he'd been talking about uh, man's wisdom. And he said in verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know how much use man's wisdom is? Zero. Zero. No contribution at all. Man's wisdom is worthless. How be it? Verse 6, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now here when he uses the word perfect, this is describing every believer as perfect. Perfect in Christ Jesus. Every believer. Listen to me. You are perfect in Christ Jesus. You lack nothing. 
Paul said we're going to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. This is not just talking about you who are more mature. This is talking about every single believer. Every single believer is perfect. How be it we speak wisdom. What the world calls foolishness, those that are perfect see it as wisdom. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, that come to nothing. You know, we really do see the vanity of human wisdom. And it's not even needed or desired in this thing of preaching the gospel. I love what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.17. He said, uh, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. Not trying to make the gospel understandable. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to preach the gospel, give the actual content of the gospel from the word of God, and trust God the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. We don't use wisdom of words. I, uh, we don't try to package and market the gospel to make it more appealing and less offensive. We hate the wisdom of words. I, you know, there's nothing I don't think that irritates me more. When I hear a man preaching, and I can tell he has some understanding or belief of grace, but he tries to hide it, so as not to offend anybody, and he says things here. Here's my perfect example. I've, I've used this before. Uh, Christ died for those who will believe. Yeah. Anybody be happy with that? Somebody that believes in universal redemption would agree with that. Christ died for the elect. Christ died for a sheep. Be, be clear about it. Don't use wisdom of words trying to make the gospel less offensive. He says in verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world was. I love this thought of mystery. The gospel is mystery. It's, it's something we would have never known had not God made it known. It's so mysterious in that sense. It's, it's not talking about mystery to me. I don't mean that at all. I know God is one God in three persons. That's a great mystery. It's because God has made it known. I didn't figure it out. I didn't think, well, I'm going to try to figure out what God's like. Well, here it is. He must be one God in three persons. Nobody ever did anything like that. But we hear the mystery and we believe it. It's not so much we even understand it, but believe it. We don't try to explain it. We proclaim it and trust God the Holy Spirit to make it known. I am so persuaded that what I'm preaching is the gospel. I'm persuaded that I can preach it and just leave you alone. God will teach you. I can't teach anybody. God can, though. And that's what Paul is saying. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and to our glory. You see, his wisdom is eternal. It's always been. There's nothing new. This is eternal. Everything concerning God is eternal. I love what the wise man said when he said, there's nothing new under the sun. There's not. This wisdom is the eternal wisdom of God. It never had a beginning. It'll never have an end. Which none, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, they would have known who he is. The wisdom is knowing who he is. The thief on the cross had wisdom. He knew who the Lord was. God gave him that wisdom, but he knew who he was. That's why he said, remember me when you come back in your kingdom. He knew he wouldn't stay dead because he's the God man. He knew he would return as a mighty reigning king because he knew who he was. None of the princes of this world do. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, verse 9, how many times do we read that phrase in the New Testament? I don't know. I need to look it up one of these days, but it's a lot, isn't it? As it is written. Now, the full canon of Scripture had not been written. He was talking about the Old Testament Scripture. See, the gospel in the Old Testament is the same as the gospel in the New Testament. When we're talking about spiritual men and carnal men, well, what God said, a new heart will I give you. That's Old Testament. A new spirit will I put within you. Uh, this is what the scriptures have always taught. As it's written, 
And listen, look at this statement. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, usually when people look at that verse of Scripture and say, we don't know what heaven's going to be like. And we don't. I know it's a holy place. I know there's no sin there. Uh, but can I describe what heaven's like? Well, we can read scriptures, but uh, we don't have a clue of how glorious it's going to be. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about how we don't know what heaven's going to be like. What's he saying? But as it's written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. This is talking about the things God has prepared for every believer. He said, I go to the cross and prepare a place for you. Now, because he prepared the place for me, there's a seat reserved for me. He prepared it. I go and prepare a place for you. He went to the cross to prepare all the things of salvation he prepared for me. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Justification, sanctification, glorification, being foreknown, being called, being born again. Uh, every doctrine of the scripture concerning the salvation of God, he's revealed them unto us. If you know, it's because he has revealed it. What an amazing thing that the God of glory would reveal himself to me. He's revealed them. Revelation. He's revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth. Verse 10. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. God being one God in three persons is deep, isn't it? A sinner being justified before God and sinless is deep, isn't it? Being eternally united to Christ, so there's never been a time when I was not united to him. However old God is, that's how long I've been united to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's deep, isn't it? That's transcendent. That's glorious. That's a... Like David said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I can't attain unto it. But I believe it. I believe it. He's revealed it. He's revealed the deep things of God by a spirit. For what man knoweth, of, verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Do you know what's going on in my mind? Lynn would say she does. Um, but a lot of times she does. I'll give her that. Uh, but um, you don't know what's going on in my mind. You can't see the deep things that are in my mind. You know the only one who knows what's going on in my mind? Me. I know. And the only way you'll know what's going on in my mind is if I tell you. And the only way you'll know what's going on in God's mind is if he tells you by his spirit. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. He knows. He is God. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world but that spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us. Of God. Most preaching presents God offering things. I'm offering you forgiveness of sins. I'm offering you salvation. It's, it's up to you. I'm offering it. I'm, this is the free offer of the gospel. I'm offering everybody salvation. You just got to take it. 
It's up to you as to whether or not you'll accept it or reject it. God doesn't offer anything. He gives. He freely gives. Romans 8, 32. Oh, don't you love that scripture? Uh, with that God, that we, how can I forget that? Turn with me there. I am, um, Getting old. <laughs> Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son. I know it now. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not freely give us all things. That's what we're taught. We're taught that he freely gives us, not offers, not makes available. He freely gives us all things, all the things of salvation. He freely gives, not offers, but gives. That includes every aspect of salvation. Now, let's read verses 12 and 13 together. Now, we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. This is the content of our preaching. We speak these things. We don't, we don't try to couch them with the wisdom of words so nobody will be offended or uh, it'll be easier to see. We, we speak these things that are freely given to us of God. Once again, preach. What, I love what to preach the word. Does the word declare that God elected a people? Preach it. Don't apologize for it. Don't try to soften it. That's true with regard to everything God says. Which things we speak. David said, I believed Therefore have I spoken. That's the spirit of faith. Which things we speak, speaking the words of God. Which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, Let's go back to this concept of mystery. It's not explained. It's proclaimed. It's not so much understood as believed. And we use these spiritual words, the words of Christ, the words that I speak unto you, they're spirit and they are life. We use these spiritual words and the spiritual person understands. He believes. He receives. He rejoices in what he's hearing. He's been given ears to hear. And he hears the message. The Lord said, the word that I speak unto you, the, the words that I speak unto you are words of spirit and life. And it's only the spiritual man that can receive these words. But, verse 14, but, the natural man, somebody that has never been born again, Somebody who only has one nature, the nature he was born with. The way you and I were born into this world, dead in trespasses and sins. The natural man. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. He hears this and he says, that's Foolishness. You expect me to believe that? It's foolishness to him. And he says this even stronger. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. He lacks the ability to know them, to, to embrace them, to receive them. He lacks the ability. He can't know them. You know, the Lord said in John chapter 8, why can't you understand my speech? 
because you can't hear my word. You cannot hear my word. You lack the ability to hear my word. And so, you know, in this thing of preaching, it, this is so comforting to me in trying to preach. I preach the word, and if God the Holy Spirit makes it effectual to you, you'll hear, you'll believe, you'll rejoice, you'll receive the words of God. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness in him. Neither indeed can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. You have to have a spiritual nature to receive and to rejoice in and to love spiritual words. Finding the words of Christ, words of spirit and words of truth. and Oh, it's, it's life. Thou hast the words of eternal life, Peter said. These words that these people have found harsh sayings, we find them to be words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Spiritually discerned. But, unlike the natural man, he that is spiritual, discerneth, has ears to hear all things. Let me show you a verse of Scripture in 1 John chapter 2. Hold your finger there in 1 Corinthians. But you have an unction, verse 20. But you have an unction, an anointing is the word, an anointing, from the Holy One, and you know all things. Does that mean we're omniscient? Of course not. Does it mean we have the perfect uh, human brain of the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course not. What does it mean? We know all things. If you know Christ is all, guess what? You know all things. He's taught you. Look in verse 27. Same chapter. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Now when God has taught you, you know what you're going to do? You're going to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't want to be seen anywhere else. That's, that's the anointing of God the Holy Spirit. Now turn back to 1 Corinthians 2. He that is spiritual discerneth all things. And as, and as much as anything else, because you know God, you know his character. Every believer, no, like for instance, you you. Can't love God and not love his sovereignty. You can't love God and not love his justice. You can't love God and not love his holiness. You can't love God and not love his immutability. Any attribute of God, because you know him, you hear. And you hear when something is contrary to one of his glorious attributes, because you know him. Um, he that is spiritual judges all things, discerns all things, Yet he himself is discerned of no man. Now, a natural man, if you're talking to a natural man like this, he's going to say, you're crazy. You're crazy. That doesn't even make sense. That's foolishness. I don't understand this. That's his response. He's judged or discerned of no man. Why is it an, a believer understands the natural man? Not only do I have a new nature, I still have my old nature. And I understand him. He can't understand me, though. Because I've got a nature he doesn't have. And if you only have one nature, you can't possibly understand two natures. It just doesn't make sense to you. But if you have the Lord, you know. Verse 16. Four. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may 
instruct him? Nobody. Nobody. I love when he said to Job, where were you when I created the universe? Where were you when I stretched out the heavens? Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Me and you haven't. But we have the mind of Christ. Not we think like he does. Does Christ know his Father is altogether glorious? We do too. Does Christ love every one of his Father's attributes? We do too. Does Christ possess all of his Father's attributes? Does he know that? Does he know he's equal with the Father? We do too. We have the mind of Christ. Does Christ love his Father's glory? We do too. Does Christ know he's everything in salvation? You know, he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He knows that. We know it too. Does Christ love his Father's will? Not my will, but thine be done. Well, we're taught to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we want our will crossed if it's contrary to his will, don't we? I mean, I, I, thy will be done. Does Christ love to save sinners? Yeah. We love him to save sinners too, don't we? We have the mind of Christ. No natural man does. Every spiritual man does and this is what god recognizes not all of our fleshly distinctions which are stupid anyway natural or spiritual may god make every one of us spiritual men and women hearing his word discerning his word and believing his gospel Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful that you've been pleased to give us this book in which you tell us who you are, who we are, and how you save sinners by your Son. And Lord, we can read the book and not understand any of it unless you're pleased by your Spirit to make us spiritual men who receive these spiritual words. Lord, if there's anybody in this room who has never believed, never been born of the Spirit, we ask in Christ's name that you would birth them and give them the grace to trust your son fully and to see his beauty and his glory. How thankful we are for the revelation of him. Bless this word for his sake and in his name. In his name we pray. Amen. Um,